Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. To the internet, my friend. How can I help you? Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Miller, and we are going to have some notes now for our unit on immigration, urbanization, and segregation, a lot of shuns, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And our image uh, here is one that I took myself back in, oh, 2004, which probably is before many of you were born. Um, and this is a picture of Ellis Island, uh, in uh, New York Harbor, and uh, I went and visited there uh, on a trip um, uh, around Christmas time uh, that year, and got to see Ellis Island, and it was uh, an immigration station, immigration center where immigrants from all over the world, although probably primarily from Europe, uh, came through before they could enter the United States. And it's no longer an immigration station now. It is just a museum. I say just a museum. It is a museum. But it's a, a really interesting place to visit and learn about the history of immigrants uh, to this United States. And if you uh, have European ancestors, uh, probably a good bet that at least some of them came through this port of entry. Excellent. And so here's our title for uh, today, as I already said. The U.S. grows but remains divided. Again, we're talking about immigration urbanization, but segregation remained. <laughs> so first of all, we got to talk about the new immigrants. And uh, immigration to the United States happens has happened in waves. And again, the time period we're focusing on is the late 1800s, early 1900s. So this is a wave of immigrants. It, it changes uh, depending upon a whole lot of different things, conditions overseas, the people who are in power, the laws passed to limit or allow immigration. It, it all varies from time period to time period. So immigrants came to the U.S. in the late 1800s and early 1900s for a number of reasons. And if you remember in class, I talked about the push factors and the pull factors um, that would affect these immigrants. For example, food shortages in their home country was a push factor. Land shortages in their home country, it's a push. Overpopulation in their home country, push. Religious persecution, push factory, uh, factory factor. Political persecution, it's a push factor. The desire for work um, is a pull factor, or job opportunities in the United States would be a pull factor. Freedom is guaranteed under the Constitution, that would be a pull factor. Better education available in the United States, that would all be that would be a pull factor too. So there are different things which push people out of their own country and pull them to the United States, just like there are today. Different groups left for different reasons. For example, Jews left from Russia to escape religious persecution uh, during the late 1800s or 1900s. There was a series of uh, pogroms or, or, or I guess say purges of Jewish people, and they left. Uh, Eastern Europe and Russia looking for a better life somewhere. A great example of a musical, uh, if you're into theater, if you're into musical, that would relate to you. A bit of that story would be Fiddler on the Roof of uh, Jewish people leaving uh, Eastern Europe or Russia to come to the United States to find a better life. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof focuses on a family um, from a village called Anatevka. And I uh, can't recommend it enough. Ay, no es bueno. So where do they come from? Well, immigrants from Europe generally came to the East Coast across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, 20 million came to the U.S. from Europe between 1870 and 1920. Uh, they left in part because the population of Europe doubled from 200 to 400 million during the 19th century. And so again, we got those push factors, that lack of food, that lack of land, overpopulation, there's not enough resources to go around. So you got to find a better life for your family. you got to find a better place for them. Here's um, a bit of a map here showing U.S. immigration from 1840 to 1920. And um, you can see all the different numbers here 
coming from different parts of Europe to uh, the United States, not to belabor the point, but uh, Great Britain and Ireland, 7.9 million. Um, uh, Russia, 3.28 million. Scandinavia, 1.95 million. Even from close by, Asia, or not, sorry, Asia, not, Mexico and Canada, relatively close by. Asia is obviously not close to the United States, but 790,000 people from Asia came to the United States. So immigration was, was very, was very varied. Immigrants from Asia usually came to the west coast of America across the Pacific Ocean, but in much smaller numbers. Uh, between 1851 and 1883, 300,000 Chinese people arrived. Uh, by 1920, 200,000 Japanese people called the U.S. home. And we've, we've talked a lot about in class about uh, Chinese immigrants coming to work um, in the United States, uh, often work on railroads, um, trying to make money there. Uh, the, and also we talked about the contribution that uh, Chinese people made to the creation of the Transcontinental Railroad. But we haven't really talked about Japanese immigrants a whole lot. Um, here you can see just a map, a basic map of uh, the geography of these two countries, China and Japan, uh, two uh, very different uh, countries that share some of the same tradition, uh, but also very unique in their own ways. And I wanted to talk for a, picture, a minute here about this picture on the right here. These are what they call a picture brides or postcard brides. Um, at, on the West Coast, uh, Asian immigrants were uh, not permitted to marry uh, uh, Caucasians. Um, and so Japanese men often couldn't find a bride. So uh, if they wanted to marry, they had to send, literally send for uh, a person uh, back in Japan to come over and, and join them. And so uh, they were set up with, uh, they were sent postcards or pictures of a potential brides and they would um, m make a match that way um kind of an interesting thing <laughs> today we have uh, you know things like tinder and facebook and things like that um but there were simpler things going on uh, over a hundred years ago uh, i also want to talk about immigrants from mexico and the west indies uh, between 1880 and 1920, 260,000 people came from the islands of Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and other Caribbean locations. Between 1910 and 1930, 700,000 Mexicans left their home country. So we, in the United States, are currently seeing uh, uh, a lot of immigration coming from Latin America and Mexico, but that is nothing new. That's been going on for uh, a very long time in our country. And here we can see a, a map of the geography here. We have Mexico, uh, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Hi, everybody! Hi, Dr. Nick! Yes, I am a Simpsons fan, as you know. Uh, the journey to get to the United States was not an easy one. The trip from Europe took about one week, while the trip from Asia took around three weeks. Immigrants traveled cheaply, so they were confined to steerage, that's the ship's cargo hold. Um, this is a picture, often used picture in media these days, of uh, Chinese immigrants uh, occupying steerage, uh, eating rice. You can see the conditions are, are not very nice. They're cramped and uh, not a lot of space to yourself. Um, things uh, like disease and uh, uh, problems would, would spread here very uh, quickly. Um, but people did what they had to uh, to get over here to find a better life. Um, immigrants also had to go through immigration stations, as we talked about from the outset here. They first had to pass a physical. Uh, if they passed, they were then sent to a government inspector who checked their documents and checked to see if they met legal requirements to enter the U.S. No criminal record, ability to work, some financial security. Here's some pictures that I took when I was at Ellis Island. You can see some of the uh, the tests. One of the tests they had to go through, um, a shape test here. Um, uh, can you put these shapes in the right space? The completion time for a nine-year-old was 20 seconds. Again, these mental uh, tests uh, to make sure that you were able, you were fit to come here. Um, Ellis Island also had a, a hospital attached to it. And so... Uh, if you had a disease when you got here, you could be quarantined uh, there until you got better, until they decided to send you back home. 
Here's a wheelchair from that uh, time period. Again, the immigration station in the east was Ellis Island, located in New York Harbor. Ellis was the chief immigration station in the U.S. from 1892 to 1924. Uh, here's a picture of uh, my wife and I um, when we went to uh, New York on that trip I told you about. And that's the Empire State Building. But here's some more pictures of Ellis Island. Um, here is the reception hall where immigrants would come. Um, they have uh, the museum. It's a museum now. Again, it, a lot of different pictures and things to see. Uh, samples of uh, uh, the types of luggage the immigrants would carry. Uh, immig uh, tower on Ellis Island here. The station on the West Coast, however, was quite different. This was Angel Island in San Francisco Bay. Most Asian immigrants went through here. And they would endure harsh questioning and be t detained for days in a rundown shacks. This is Angel Island, more like a prison than an immigration station. And if you remember our video about uh, Fong Si and his family, uh, Asian immigrants could be detained here in in indefinitely until they were finally let in or they were sent back home. Me fail English? That's impossible! So let's say you do get into the United States. What happens when you get here? Well, in order to make life easier, immigrants would organize into small communities. Uh, examples would be Chinatown or Little Italy, the most famous of both being in uh, New York City. Um, but, of course, these types of uh, places uh, spread across all over the United States. Uh, in Ohio, even, we have Little Italy in Cleveland or Germantown, the German village in Columbus. And you can go to uh, visit a lot of these places today. Now, a lot of them may not be as large as they used to be. They may have shrunk. Um, but uh, a lot of them still retain a lot of the flavor and culture that uh, they had when they were originally uh, founded. If founded is the right word for it. Now I'm going to play you a little video here uh, from Chinatown. All about New York Chinatown. Let's go down, let's go down, let's go down to Chinatown. What's this I see? What's this I see? It's next to Little Italy. Vegetable lo mein, shrimp fried rice, mushu chicken is very nice. Let's use chopsticks, yum, 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 between our pointer finger and thumb. Egg rolls, wontons, broccoli, scallion, pancake, mandarin beef. Let's go down, let's go down, let's go down to Chinatown. Let's go down, let's go down, let's go down to Chinatown. What's this I see? What's this I see? It's next to Little Italy. Vegetable lo mein, shrimp fried rice, mushu chicken is very nice. Let's use chopsticks, yum, 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 between our pointer finger and thumb. Egg rolls, wontons, broccoli, scallion, pancake, mandarin beef. Let's go down, let's go down, let's go down to Chinatown. Let's go down, let's go down, let's go down to Chinatown. So that was a little song about uh, Chinatown, obviously made for the, the Sesame Street set, but my kids enjoyed it, so I figured you might enjoy it too. Hope I didn't create a brain worm for you for the rest of the day. Um, many Americans responded to these immigrants by practicing nativism or favoritism to native-born citizens. Nativists believed that the only people from the were the only people from the right countries, such as England, Germany, and Scandinavian nations, should immigrate. Um, and and so you had to be from the right area of Europe, have the right skin color, um, as well. But also you had to be uh, the right religion. Religion also mattered. In particular, Catholics and Jews were disliked because they were believed to undermine the country's democratic principles, which were uh, designed by Protestants. Of course, you know Catholics and Jews uh, came around the same time that Protestants came, but not in as uh, great numbers. Um. And so uh, Protestants felt threatened, especially by, uh, by Catholics, because Catholics um, look up to the Pope. Um, uh, here's a picture of the current Pope, Pope Francis, uh, as their leader. And um, Protestants felt, again, this a threat to democratic principles. Like, we choose our leaders here, we vote for them, um, and you're coming to our country now, and you, but you're ruled by this papal dictator overseas. Um, and, and so Protestants, that's how they viewed the situation. That's how they viewed Catholics in many cases, and, and they you know, felt threatened by it. Um, but uh, 
now, I mean, we don't really have this problem in the United States. There is, uh, you know, tensions at some time, but for the most part, both groups accept each other. Um, but even uh, Catholics uh, within Catholicism, when they came to the country, would have problems. Even if you look at Zanesville, we have two big Catholic churches downtown. We have St. Nicholas and we have St. Thomas Aquinas. And you look like, why would we have two big churches like that so close together when they're both Catholic? Um, well, very frankly, St. Nicholas was founded by the German immigrants. And St. Thomas Aquinas was founded by Irish immigrants. And they each wanted their own uh particular church and follow their own particular cultures, even though they both considered themselves a Catholic. So um, there is a, a problem with uh, being from the right area and being the right religion and the right skin color. Um, nativists really had a, a set vision of what uh, an, an American should be. <coughs> of course, laws were passed to limit immigration uh, as a result of a lot of this nativist feeling, um, they wanted to limit the flow of people into the U.S. melting pot. And the U.S. is often described as melting pot as accurately or as inaccurately as that term is often used. It means a mixture of many cultures and peoples and religions from all around the world. Um, in 1882, though, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And as we saw with uh, um, Fong, the video about Fong Si, this was designed to keep Chinese people out of the United States uh, not they don't want like basic laborers coming in. If you were Chinese or coming to the United States, you got to have a specific trade. Um, and um, as we can see from this cartoon, there was a lot of racist flavor um, at the time, uh, 1880s, trying to keep Chinese people out. They were viewed as the stereotypical uh, Chinese person here. You can see in this political cartoon, he's riding a horse, and the white people are making him. Uh, jump through hoops. They're not allowed to have citizenship. They're not allowed to get married to uh, Caucasian people. They're uh, not allowed <clears throat> to be educated. Like in San Francisco, um, they were prevented from being educated for a very long time. So Chinese people had a lot of obstacles, as it says here, uh, when they came to the United States. Japanese immigration was also limited by the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 and 1908, uh, which was... Uh, a word of mouth agreement between the U.S. and Japan that Japan would not allow uh, the basic laborers to come over to the United States um, and that the U.S. in return would not discriminate against the Japanese people already here. Um, in 1917, more about that later, I think when we get to World War II, in 1917, a bill was passed by the U.S. Congress which required immigrants to pass a literacy test and if they could not read, they could not enter the U.S. Uh, your silk wearing buttercup. Yes, I like The Simpsons again. As immigration increases, cities grow. Uh, immigration industry would cause urbanization or the growth of cities. Immigrants would settle in the cities because uh, it was cheaper to live in cities at that time, and there were many manufacturing jobs here and there, and they, they had to live close to their jobs. They didn't have a car, so they needed to take advantage of public transportation. Here is a picture of where many of these immigrants would live. These are tenements. Um, these often two-room apartments where four to five families often would live um, trying to um, uh, make a living in big cities in the United States. And these were very cramped. People would literally uh, sleep in shifts. Um, and they would just be living on top of each other. It was not a, a good situation. The increase in foreigners was called the, uh, this increase in foreigners called the cause, sorry, the Americanization movement, which was designed to assimilate immigrants into American culture. The government would sponsor classes in English, American history, and uh, government in order to teach people what it was like to be an American. And, uh, cartoon from my childhood called an American tale it was a movie all about uh, a little immigrant mouse um, from um, uh, Eastern Europe Russia um, Fievel Mouskovitz and he is a Jewish mouse um, I didn't know we could classify mice as Jewish or Protestant or Catholic but I guess we can and um, this mouse uh, came to the United States and um, experienced a lot of the same things that immigrants in real life experienced and now I'm going to play for you just a little selection from um, American Tale to uh, emphasize this point. I 
want to get out of here. <laughs> you and me both. I have to find my family. Ah, shut up. Go to sleep. Right down. Ah, keep quiet. I wish we had that mouse with the long hair. She could drop her hair out the window, and we can all climb down. Sure. Out the window. Ah, oh, fairy tale. Wait a minute. This kid might have something. Tony Top Pony's the name. Put it there, uh... Fivel. Fivel Mouse Quits. Fivel? Ooh, that name's got a goal. Hey, I'll tell you what, the Philly. Philly? Yeah, fits you perfect. Hey, Philly, <clears throat> you got any idea where your family is? Philly! Philly Masterwood! And so I hope you enjoyed that um, little snippet from An American Tale. It's made by uh, was made by Don Bluth. Had several um, sequels to it. Uh, I enjoyed it growing up. Cities would also grow, not just because of immigration, but a migration within the United States uh, from rural areas. Uh, many farms no longer 
uh, needed manual labor because of new technology. Farm laborers, especially blacks, would turn to cities uh, to find jobs. And, and we'll get into this more when we talk about the 1920s, but uh, the movement of blacks is often called the Great Migration uh, to cities um, to find jobs. And again, more on the Great Migration later. Um, city land became scarce. Uh, landowners decided to build up, not out, through the use of skyscrapers. And these build buildings were supported by steel frames and became very common. We've talked about Andrew Carnegie and his uh, monopoly over steel manufacturing. And um, most of that steel, where did it go? Well, railroads were a place where it went, but it went more into structural steel. And uh, structural steel used to build um, skyscrapers. Now, on, these are both pictures from uh, New York. And uh, on the left side, we see the one of the first skyscrapers called the Flatiron Building. Um, and it still stands today. It's a very uh, triangular-shaped, unique building, which is definitely, um, uh, I would guess they would be, New Yorkers would call it beloved today. Although when it first came up, people were unsure about it. They thought that um, its, uh, its angle and its shape actually was it caused a wind tunnel, which was damaging to local businesses. But now New York is, is full of skyscrapers, and we can see a uh, prominent skyline here. On the left, you can see uh, Empire State Building, and then you can see the Chrysler Building on the right, um, which is like a 1920s Art Deco, I guess you could call it, design. And uh, and that, that trend would continue all throughout the United States. Now, maybe we don't build as many skyscrapers in the United States today, but there's still uh, very much uh, in vogue, I guess you could say, around the world. Caramba. But as cities grow, problems also grow. As urbanization continues, several problems arose. One problem, um, housing. As people moved into the cities, they would take over single-family dwellings, um, and they would often become overcrowded with two or three families, and I said in other in another slide, four or five families living in a house meant for just one. And, and these were known as tenements. And right now, I'm going to play you a little... Uh, video to just give you an idea of what tenements uh, were like. But first, let's show you just some pictures of tenements here. Here you can see on the left, uh, this is the inside of a tenement. Uh, you got at least one, two, three, four people living in a, an a apartment, very small, maybe a two room, three room apartment at the most. Um, and looks like she's doing piecework there. That's work that uh, she would have taken home from her job at, at a mill um, so that she could make some extra money, make uh, more money. On the right-hand side here, we see a, a photo. I don't know if it's a, just a, I'm sure it's a photo or a, just a painting. Either way, it's a pretty accurate painting of what laundry was like, laundry day was like in these tenements. People would, of course, do their washing by hand. This is late 1800s, early 1900s, long before... Uh, you had your electric washing machines and dryers that we have today and before laundromats and stuff like that. So um, you had to do things by hand um, and you had to dry out your clothes on the line. And so everybody's clothing was out to see, hang out your dirty laundry for everyone to see, so to speak. But now, as I said, let's go to that short video about um, tenements. While neighborhoods did provide a physical and emotional barrier to the outside world, living conditions in the tenements were primitive. At the front of the building there was a window, at the back of the building there was a window, and in the middle there were two rooms without windows. That's if you had four rooms. Some people only had two rooms. We, we lived in a tenement building. There was uh, a kitchen, the living room and the bedroom. Now, uh, my father and mother had one bed, and the children all slept in a, another bed. And we slept sideways, and then we, that young, that they all fitted in. So there was all six of us lined up. In, in the summertime, I know several times I remember I sleep on a fire escape. Even if you had your whole family with three, four, five, eight children, you still took in a border with two. People slept all over. They slept on the floor. They slept on the sofas. In some instances, in some cities, you had the beds being used 24 hours a day in eight-hour shifts. 
I mean, the poor people literally were on top of one another. And it was not a healthy situation. The terrible world of the tenements gave rise to a new social reform movement. Reforms were passed, but slowly and with only modest gains for the immigrant tenants. In 1901, New York State becomes the first state that requires windows to be built in every room and indoor plumbing in the buildings. So you can imagine what it was like before then, and if New York is the first state in 1901, what about all these other cities where people came? Boston, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, and so forth. So I hope you enjoyed that short video about um, tenements. Now let's talk about another problem, transportation. Cities built mass transit systems to get people to work. These included subways, streetcars, and trains. Um, and they would aid workers, but they would also require constant upkeep and would contribute to city pollution. Uh, cars would do the same later. Um, late 1800s, though, and early 1900s, is still a little bit before Henry Ford and the Model T, so the car wasn't super affordable. Again, it was a play thing for the rich for a very long time, several decades. Here's a picture of a trolley car pulled by the horse. Um, we did have a trolley system in Zanesville uh, for a time, but as uh, automobiles became more and more popular and more and more uh, cheaper and cheaper, uh, people would turn to that, and so we don't have um, uh, we don't have a trolley system in Zanesville anymore. We do have a, a small bus system, uh, which called originally called the Z bus, but now it's called the Seat Bus, Southeastern Area Transit, I believe, and um, you know we have that now, but most people don't really utilize public transportation in Zanesville, they would utilize uh, cars. Water was a big problem, having pure drinking water. Um, for a very long time, you didn't even have indoor plumbing. You didn't have water in your house or a toilet in your house. Cities built public water systems, but they couldn't handle the large populations as immigrants kept coming and coming and more and more people kept moving and moving to cities. Um, and so, People would use what they could. They would dig latrines outside or have outhouses or things like that. Um, not a very, you know, pleasant idea. Uh, but even when filtration was introduced in the 1870s and chlorination was introduced in 1908, it was not until well into the 20th century that city drinking water would, would get any better. And, you know, today, uh, if you're going to the south side of Zanesville, um, you can, you can see the water treatment plant as you go to the south side, as you go to Maysville Pike, um, and you can, you can smell it, I think. Um, but that's what places like that are supposed to smell like a little bit, you know, uh, come up with a name yourself. But uh, that place is designed to purify our water, um, which we would get, you know, from Muskegon River. Here's a Roxboro pumping plant just outside of Philadelphia in the early 1900s, and that would be the predecessor of like our own water for purification plants we have today. Death! But these weren't the only problems that cities encountered. Sanitation. Keeping cities clean was very difficult. There was irregular trash pickup, raw sewage flowing through open gutters. Again, they couldn't extend the plumbing systems and the sewage systems fast enough to keep up with the population. Factory smoke spewing into the air. All this dirt and trouble came uh, contributed to the spread of disease. Uh, this is a picture that I'm fond of showing uh, from um, late 1800s in the United States, showing kids playing in the open gutter, a dead horse just off the side of the road, um, uh, trucks and stuff in the side. This is not a very healthy situation for these little kids to grow up in. Class separation. People living in cities became separated into three general classes. High society, middle class utility, and the working class. And uh, you can see this um, in the different types of houses people built. Your tycoons like Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller had these huge mansions, castles uh, that they would live in. Uh, whereas the working class, as we already saw, would live in tenements. Um, a huge divide between the two. This picture here uh, is of Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens outside of, right, or right in Akron. And um, this was made by the, uh, this mansion is more than a mansion. It was made by the Cyberling family. And the Cyberling family is famous for the, 
a manufacturer of uh, tires, Goodyear tires. Um, that's what, you know, Akron, before LeBron James uh, was, <laughs> could, be, could lay their claim to fame on, was the manufacturer of tires. And, of course, the Cyberlings built their own huge uh, mansion right outside, so they were like a tire tycoons of the time. And you can actually visit it today. It's a museum, and it's a really interesting place to go if you get a chance to. It's not too far away, you know, like an hour and 45 minutes or so from Zanesville. If you get the chance, go to it. It is a mission cost, but it's, it's well worth it to see just what it was like to live as a tycoon um, in the early 1900s and uh, see what uh, they enjoyed. And right now I'm going to play for you a little video all about Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens. I'm Matt Gallant and you're on the list. It makes the list of top historic homes in the country. Mike Brookbank takes us inside around Cleveland. When there's no man around, good years should be. It's the house that rubber built. It is a jewel in the crown of historic homes. Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens in Akron is the former home of the Cyberling family. Mr. Cyberling and his brother co-founded Goodyear Tire and Rubber. The Tudor Revival, which took three years to build, is massive at nearly 65,000 square feet. So how much did it cost? That is uh, one of the most asked questions and we have no answer. Another popular question has to do with spirits. It is not haunted. Here's the list of must-see features. First, the organ in the music room. You can hear it in virtually any room you're in when it's being played. Second, be sure to check out the upstairs. The master suite that has paneling from the 17th century. One of the most talked about features in the manor house is the secret passageway that goes from the library to the Great Hall. What's so unique about Stan Hewitt compared to other historic homes is that it's full of original artifacts. To see the rooms fully furnished, it's like a living museum. After touring the manor house, be sure to walk the 70-acre estate. And then to walk and wander the gardens is even a frosting on the cake. We're back now. I hope you enjoyed that uh, short video there. Um, next problem, we're going to talk about kind of two problems in one, crime and fire. Um, again, crime uh, was very difficult to control in cities as they grew in population. Um, you had a lot of nefarious individuals who want to take advantage of the, um, the chaos, I guess you could say. And so pickpocketing, murder, um, a lot of different things went on um, that uh, thankfully don't go on in the uh, amount that they do, that don't go on today in the amount that they did back then. Uh, fire was also a problem as most houses were made of wood. Kerosene was often used for heat and water was in short supply. So all of these made for a, a bad uh, s situation. Uh, the establishment of professional fire and police departments did help solve this problem. And here we can see uh, one of the first um, uh, professional fire departments here. Um, volunteer fire departments up until... Uh, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s that existed would even fight against each other to uh, to have the right to put out a fire. And while they're fighting these little wars uh, between fire departments, the house burns down. Um, I want to show you a little video, a little clip from the movie called uh, Gangs of New York. Uh, I can't show you the whole thing. It's too explicit uh, in its content to show to you, but I can show you this little clip here about um, how... Um, the different fire departments of New York City uh, fought against each other in the late in the 1860s. We always liked a good fire in the points. Fire! You could generally pick up a little swag, and if the cops came along, then you really got a show. The municipal police fought the metropolitan police. The metropolitan police. They fought the street gangs. Hurry up, man, before the black joke gets there. There were 37 amateur fire brigades, and they all fought each other. The black joke out there, please. And let's beat that shite out here. Yeah. Okay, boys! Get the hose out! There's nothing left. Go back to the bower, you punk. 
nothing. For God's sake, they're taking everything. In your next time of trouble, ma'am, call on Tammany first. But it's not too late. You can still save my house. Who will point out that this building is burning to ashes. And may I point out that this area is the province of my own America's Fire Brigade and that you lot belong only in the Bowery. May I point out that you're outmanned, outmaneuvered, and in a moment, outfought. Am I? What's the point? The fire's near burned anything of value inside. Boys, forget that one. Next building over. Mustn't let us break. Take what you want from that one. What are you doing? What are you doing? There's nothing wrong with this one. This is my house. As you can see, there were bad people who wanted to take advantage of the chaos in the cities. And some of these people were politicians. Yeah, go figure. Uh, corrupt politicians would take advantage of the chaos in the cities. Uh, this age from the 1870s to 1890s would be called the Gilded Age, a term created by authors Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Mark Twain, obviously the more famous of the two, uh, wrote books like The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and A Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court and perhaps the most famous author in American history. I hope you have had time to read some of his works. Anyway, he came up with this term, the Gilded Age. Something that's gilded, uh, very frankly, looks shiny and cool on the outside, but on the inside, not so good. And these politicians delayed a glittering exterior to hide their corrupt practices. And uh, these politicians would develop political machines. And these political machines were organized groups which controlled the activities of political parties in a city and offered services to voters in exchange for political and financial support. Um, for example, like we talk about areas like Little Italy and Chinatown, the politicians would go to these areas and say, hey, we really want the Italians in the city to back our candidate for, oh, I don't know, mayor or um, alderman or, or what, whatever, what have you. And um, the Italians would say, no, we don't want to back that. We want to back somebody else. And the politicians would say, well, you know, if you really want regular trash pickup, then you should back our candidate. Or if you want to make sure that the fire department gets to your area, if there's a fire, you want to back our candidate. Um, and so they were literally selling off city services to uh, different neighborhoods to make sure that their vote was uh, turned towards their political machine. Perhaps the best example of this was a boss tweed in New York City. He was actually portrayed in that video you just watched from uh, that clip from Gangs of New York. And now I'm going to show you a little bit more um, accurate information from a, a documentary all about um, uh, Boss Tweed uh, or about uh, political machines. In 1870, as newspaper editors and indignant reformers began questioning where Tweed's lavish lifestyle came from, all eyes turned to the still unfinished county courthouse on Chambers Street, a special project of Tweed's. Begun in 1858, it was supposed to have cost $350,000. 12 years later, the price tag had reached 13 million and kept right on rising. Somewhere on this one building, which is actually quite a nice building, um, wound up costing more than the entire Houses of Parliament. Uh, well, you know, the deal is straightforward. You, we want to buy a lot of chairs. How much does that chair cost? Uh, let's say $5. Now, says Tweed, you don't mean $5, you mean $50. Oh, I do? All right. And, you know, give me the chair, $50, you know, 20 back for you, and so forth. Even the most worldly New Yorkers knew that something had to be done. People begin to tire of holding their noses, George Templeton Strong wrote, and are looking about in a helpless way for some remedy. No caliph, Khan, or Caesar has risen to power or opulence more rapidly than Tweed the First. Ten years ago, this monarch was pursuing the humble occupation of a chairmaker. He now rules the state as Napoleon ruled France. There is absolutely nothing, nothing in the city which is beyond the reach of the insatiable gang who have obtained possession of it. The New York Times. In 1869, a German-born artist named Thomas Nast, with close ties to the Republican Party, began publishing a series of political cartoons in Harper's Weekly. 
Week after week, Nast relentlessly excoriated what he called the Tammany Hall Ring. There was Peter Brains Sweeney, the city treasurer. Mayor Abraham Oakey Hall, Tweed's puppet in City Hall. Richard Slippery Dick Conley, the comptroller. And Boss Tweed himself, whom Nast depicted as a licentious, balding, overfed monster, literally devouring the city. I don't care a straw for newspaper articles, Tweed declared. My constituents don't know how to read, but they can't help seeing them damned pictures. He was the object of one of the most successful campaigns by a political cartoonist in history. Thomas Nast really did the most extraordinary job of attacking Tweed and exposing the Tweed ring in Harper's Weekly. Those pictures will live forever. The way you can never separate Nixon from Woodward and Bernstein, you can't separate Tweed from Thomas Nast. They're wed together for, for the rest of history, I guess. On July 8th, 1871, the New York Times joined the fray, publishing excerpts from secret courthouse records obtained from a disgruntled city official. Tweed had cheated out of thousands of dollars in kickbacks. The figures were astonishing. 11 thermometers had been purchased for $7,500. Dust brooms for $41,000. One contractor had been paid $5.5 million for window shades, carpets, and furniture. It would never be clear how much Tweed's corruption had been exaggerated by the press. The New York Times put the final tally at almost $200 million. But in the end, it didn't matter. New York needed a villain equal in scale to its giant park and giant bridge. And Tweed fit the bill, in part. And so, Boss Tweed, here's a political cartoon here. Um, one of the more nefarious individuals in the history of uh, the political machines uh, in the, in the, of the Gilded Age. Um, political machines would also take opportunities for graft, which was the illegal use of your political influence for private gain. Uh, people would, any favor done by the machine would be expected to be paid back down the road, whether in votes or, uh, frankly, extortion money. Um, uh, and you could see that in, in uh, the video about Boss Tweed charging uh, exorbitant amounts of money for simple things like chairs or nails for a hammer or whatever. Gimme, gimme, gimme! But there were good people to counteract um, these <laughs> jerks, to put it frankly. Um, several reformers would attempt to provide assistance to people in urban areas by creating community centers called settlement houses. Uh, these were mostly started by college-educated women, and these houses would provide classes to help educate the urban poor lessons in e English, for example. Um, the chief, among, a chief reformer among these was Jane Adams, and she would co-found the famous Hull House in Chicago. And her efforts and those of others would develop the public sense of responsibility to the poor. Um, uh, richer, upper-class people, the tycoons, you know, they didn't live amongst these people. They didn't know what it was like. And Jane, people like Jane Adams would make her, them aware of uh, just how bad it was in some of the slums, some of the tenements. Um, another uh, famous, uh, I guess you say muckraker, who did this was Jacob Reese. Jacob Reese was a photojournalist who would take pictures of um, the, the tenements and show them to rich people uptown and say, hey, look what's going on. We need to help these people. We can't just sit idly by while these people suffer. There's a picture of Jane Addams here. Um, and uh, again, she, she was college educated. She came from a wealthy family. She could have um, lived a different life if she wanted to, but she didn't. She wanted to help. Go quit cogitating, Steinmetz, and use an open-faced club, the Sand Wedge. Mmm, open-faced club Sand Wedge. Now we're going to focus on segregation. Um, particularly, we're going to focus on the segregation of African Americans, uh, of blacks during uh, this time period. And we've already talked about the segregation that uh, Asians and uh, Europeans, uh, immigrants, had faced. But let's talk about American citizens and how they faced seg segregation. They suffered, blacks suffered greatly during this time period. In fact, many people, many historians say that the time period of Jim Crow after slavery was even worse during 
was was worse was even more worse than the time during slavery. I can easily for me to say. Um, but blacks would continually be the victims of lynching uh, during this time period, execution without a trial. I'm going to show you a picture here, which may be a little bit uh, startling to some people. But here's a picture of a lynching. And you can see they were carnival events in some cases uh, where people would gather and it would be festive and people would sell cotton candy and popcorn and, and things like that to the people coming to watch. And, and, and these pictures like these would even be sold as postcards and souvenir shops um, in local towns. This is a, a terrible, terrible um, history uh, that America needs to know about and I don't think it's very well known or not known enough. And, and we have to come to the realization just how badly uh, African Americans and, and other minority groups, particularly African Americans, were treated during the late 1800s and early 1900s. And we think, oh, well, well, slavery was over. Yeah, slavery was over. The Civil War had been fought, but um, the peace had not been won. There was so much more that needs needed to be done, and it, it still needs to be done before equality can be realized in this country. But We'll talk more about that later. Whites in the South would impose voting restrictions on blacks to take away the rights guaranteed by the, the 15th Amendment. Um, and you say, how would they take away the right to vote? Well, they would have things like literacy tests. If you were given a reading test and was found you couldn't pass, you weren't allowed to vote. Reading tests were even given in different languages to make it even more difficult to pass. To, to pass. So even if a, a black person could read and was educated, uh, they were still denied the right to uh, vote any way they could. Poll taxes, annual tax that one had to pay before voting. Um, this is a receipt um, uh, for a payment for the poll tax for the year 1918 um, in Alexandria, Louisiana. And you can see like a dollar, you think it was only a dollar, but 1918, a dollar was a lot more then than it is now. And if you were uh, somebody if you were a black person, a poor black in uh, Louisiana this time, how um, could you justify paying a dollar to vote when you needed to feed your family? And, and that represented a at least you know maybe a day's work in some cases. Um, poll taxes were extremely uh, uh, difficult for people to pay. Also, you had a grandfather clause. Uh, this was said that a man could only vote if he, his father, or grandfather had been able to vote before January 1st, 1867, since few blacks were allowed to vote before this time. Most weren't allowed. Um, and so between the literacy test and poll tax and the grandfather clause and lynching, which was used to intimidate blacks, uh, keep them from voting, all of these things uh, were used to stamp out the black vote in the South. Now, the Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, we do need to mention this. This would take further take away the rights of blacks uh, by creating Jim Crow laws, or making Jim Crow laws legal, I should say. Laws which called for the separation of the races. Um, the idea here was that um, the segregation of the races was fine as long as the facilities provided were separate and equal. Separate but equal is the phrase. But in most cases, uh, the facilities provided were never equal. Um, for example, uh, whites would receive a refrigerated water fountain that would uh, spit out cold water, whereas uh, blacks would receive mild, uh, tepid, temp tepid water here that would taste terrible, not filtrated at all. You'd have uh, white people ha with indoor plumbing and they would have uh, toilets that flush while black people would be forced to use outhouses. Um, Ridiculous from our modern standpoint, but very much uh, common, very common in uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, when slavery was supposed to have ended. Segregation replaced it. Um, now, the man on the left um, was a man named Homer Plessy, and he um, challenged uh, this separation. He was a very light-skinned black man, and he um, challenged the uh, segregation of a rail car and knowingly sat in the white rail car um, and made it known that he was a black person sitting in a white rail car and he was arrested, uh, fined, but challenged that fine and challenged it all the way to the Supreme Court. 
the Supreme Court heard the case, and it was kind of like a, a, a test on whether Jim Crow laws would be legal or not. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court at this time in 1896 found that uh, they found in favor of Ferguson and not Homer Plessy, and they said, no, the, these facilities are fine. You can have separate for seg segregated facilities um, as uh, we have had, as long as they're separate but equal. And you could see, like, even the sign, though, this, this law, this finding would extend beyond blacks and whites to whites and Asians, to whites and Latinos, to whites, whites and almost every other race, you could say. Um, and, and so this would be a very dark point in our history, which would continue uh, for decades after Plessy v. Ferguson. Now, blacks would also suffer under the convict lease system, um, where they would be imprisoned for petty crimes and then forced to work for companies who paid the state to use them. And this convict lease system, uh, many say it still continues today, where people are arrested for very um, slight uh, infractions, but then put to very hard labor to work off their, their debt and don't get very much money for it at all. Um, uh, but I like it. these were big problems that black people face. And how do you fix these problems? How do you begin? Well, different black leaders were divided on this issue. Uh, for example, activist Booker T. Washington, a very famous black activist, wanted blacks to work within the system of Jim Crow. He thought that by working their way gradually up the social ladder, blacks would eventually be fully accepted into American society. Um, his picture of Booker T. Washington, he would actually became very famous when Theodore Roosevelt invited him to dinner at the White House, um, which had not happened before. Of course, black people helped, slaves helped build the White House in Washington, D.C., um, and black people worked in the White House, but never had one been invited as a guest by the president. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, for uh, all for the faults that he had, um, tried to uh, bring attention to the problems. Uh, did not invite him back afterwards. Um, got a lot of complaints from his southern constituents. But um, Booker T. Washington, very famous, and his opinion was not to be ignored. However, there were more ad more radical activists like I. D. B. Wells and W. E. B. Du Bois. Uh, they would take a great offense with Washington, and they advocate more radical change. They wanted blacks to have equality now, not over the coming decades. They cited things like, look how long it took to get rid of slavery. Look how we're being treated now. Do you think that whites are going to want to give up the power that they have over us? No, we need to have change now, and if we don't, nothing's going to happen. Here's a picture of Ida B. Wells on the left and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois on the right. Uh, du Bois, uh, rather famous, uh, the first man to come um, from Harvard with a, a doctorate, black man to come from Harvard with a doctorate, and uh, wrote a very famous book called The Souls of Black Folk. Um, du Bois would help found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAAC, NAACP, which would fight for black rights, and which is still active today. A very important case on the Supreme Court called the uh, Brown versus Board of Education, but it would be initiated by the NAACP. And we'll talk more about that when we get to our unit on civil rights. Here's the seal for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, founded in 1909. That's it, I'm out of here. Conditions in cities uh, would improve, uh, but we still suffer from these problems today. Um, and while we've gotten better, we still have a long way to go. Yeah.